beneath the I heard about his healing of his cleansing power revealing how he made the lame to walk again and caused the blind to see and then I cried dear Jesus come and heal my broken spirit and somehow Jesus came and won to me the victory. Oh, victory, Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ever knew him and all my love. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea. About the angel singing and the old redemption story and some sweet day i'll sing up there the song of victory oh victory and jesus my savior forever he sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood he loved me and I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Amen. Number 27. You're in good voice. Keep it up. Number 27. We'll stand on the last verse. <laughs> suffering and shame and I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of love sinners was slain so I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Oh, the old rugged cross, so despised by the world, has a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God, left his glory above to bear it to dark cavalry so i'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last i lay down i will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange Sunday for a crown. In the old rugged cross, stained with blood so divine, a wondrous beauty I see. For it was on that old cross, Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for Everyone standing 
to the old rugged cross I will ever be true it's shame and reproach gladly bear then he'll call me someday to my home far away where his glory forever I'll share so we'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown Welcome to our Sunday morning service I hope you young people enjoyed your Sunday school classes I think you are Teachers went above and beyond, making it a real nice morning for you. And uh, so I hope that you've enjoyed that. A couple of prayer requests was turned in. By the way, it's good to see Charlotte and it's good to see Billy. Uh, they, uh, of course, used to be very faithful to our church, moved to Terre Haute, drove all the way from Terre Haute to be with us today. So you be sure and say hi to them. Uh, he would he asked that we pray for Brandy Mathis for health issues, Brandy Mathis. And then Brother Bud mentioned this to me and I wanted to get it out where we can begin to pray, but he's scheduled for a heart cath on Wednesday, August 18th, Wednesday, August 18th, 7 a.m., and we'll get that information out to you so that you can have it. So let's begin to pray, Brother Bud. We will be praying for you on that. Well, we have had wonderful answers to prayer when it comes to little Grayson, and uh, we've been able to watch God really reach and turn that situation. Now, folks, he's still fragile and he's still got a long way to go. But you talk about being in a lot better place right now than he was even four or five days ago. God has been so good. And so thank you. I think when I sent out one of the prayer uh, requests, I said at the end of it, it sure is wonderful to be a part of a, pray a praying church. And thank you, church, for just doing that. God bless you for being faithful in it. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do want to lift up our voice. We do want to pray, dear God, and ask you to continue to work in Grayson's life, Lord. Uh, I've, I've seen the encouragement this has been to their parents, Lord. Uh, it's an encouragement to our whole church. And thank you just for reaching down, helping in that situation. We pray for Brandy Mathis and the health issues that she's facing that you'd help her. And then, Lord, for Brother Bud, this heart calf, dear God, there's some issues they need to figure out. So I pray, Lord, you'll uh, be with him during the procedure and also that you give the doctors good discernment. We pray for help and healing, Lord, in advance. And, Lord, that you take good care of our brother. Lord, thank you for Sunday mornings. Uh, Lord, thank you for the, the, the assembly, the gathering of God's people, Lord. Had our many of our folks out throughout the summertime, uh, uh, taking vacations and, and in and out a little bit. Lord, thank you for watching over each one as they went, bringing them back safely to us, Lord. And I pray that, that, that you would meet with us in a special way. We want to pray for our junior church, our primary church. And Lord, that you uh, just move mightily in those services. If there's anyone here without Christ as their Savior, may they be saved today. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen and you may be seated. All right, we have our ushers at the front here, and they have visitors' packets. They'd love to be able to put it in your hand if you're visiting here today. There's a card on the outside. Would you please fill that out? Drop it in the offering plate. If there's anyone visiting here today, if you'll raise your hand, we'll come right to you with the visitors' packet. And thank you again. So good to see both of you. Thank you for being with us today. Just a few announcements. Of course, tonight we'll be back here at 6 o'clock for our evening service. And then don't forget our midweek service. Uh, that's Wednesdays at 7 o'clock, Bible study and prayer meeting time. And so you remember that also. Visitation, so many opportunities are in the bulletin. Be in prayers. We are on the home stretch of preparing for the opening of Blessed Hope Baptist School. And so you be in prayer for that. We'll have parent orientation Monday, August 16th, uh, 6.30. And then staff training at 5 o'clock. And then also first day of school, Tuesday, August 17th. Appreciate you praying for the young men that went out, uh, went to football camp. And Brother Max, it's good to see you back safe. Michael, did you survive? All right. Did you get knocked down? Did you knock anybody down? All right, good. All right. That's why we sent you up there to do both. And uh, then Brother Joe, maybe he passed. We don't know what's happened to him. 
Was he was he alive when you brought him back here? Was he still breathing? Did you breathe and bring him back? Pray for Brother Joe wherever he's at. And uh, hey, we only lost one. That's not bad. That's not bad. That's a good football camp. You only lose one. And so anyway, I appreciate Brother Roger Young taking the young men up there and God being with our young men. Number 137. Number 137. <laughs> In times like these, you need a Savior. In times like these, you need an anchor. Be very sure, be very sure. Your anchor holds and grips a solid rock. This rock is Jesus. Yes, he's so one. This rock is Jesus, the only one. Be very sure. Be very sure your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. In times like these, you need the Bible. In times like these, oh, be not idle. Be very sure, be very sure your anchor holds. And grips a solid rock. This rock is Jesus. Yes, he's the one. This rock is Jesus. The only one. Be very sure. Be very sure. Your anchor holds. And grips a solid rock. In times like these. I have a Savior in times like these. I have an anchor. I'm very sure. I'm very sure. My anchor holds and grips a solid rock. This rock is Jesus. Yes, he's the one. This rock is Jesus. The only one, I'm very sure, I'm very sure, my anchor holds and grips a solid rock. Amen. Number 244, Amazing Grace 244. <laughs> Sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart. My fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear? The hour I first believed. Through many dangers, toils, and stairs, I have. Already come, tis grace that brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. When we've been there ten thousand years, bright shining. As the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Jeff, would you lead us in prayer, please? Dear 
Dear Heavenly Father, thank you once again for allowing us to be here in your house this morning. Lord, we thank you for this church. Lord, we thank you for giving it to us. Lord, we thank you here in just a few minutes. The man of God is going to open your word. Teach us, Lord, what you lay on his heart for this hour. Mm. Should we guide you, Lord, give him wisdom. Lord, give him clarity of mind, thought, speech, strength in his body. But most of all, Lord, give him the liberty that he needs to deliver the message you play on his heart. Lord, help each of us to give from it what you put in there for us personally. There may be anyone on the property, Lord, that's unsafe, that doesn't know they've got a home in heaven. We pray that we get that settled today. Please take this off, and Lord, use it for your honor, for your glory, and most of all, mm. for the of the gospel. Mm. We love you, Jesus. Thank you for dying on the cross for our sins. In your wonderful name we pray. Amen. Sin 
will leave you longer than you want to stay. Sin will cost you far more than you want to pay. Sin will take you farther than you want to go. Slowly but wholly taking control. Sin will leave you longer than you want to stay. Sin will cost you far more than you want to pay. Sin will cost you far more than you want to pay. Thank you. Let's go to Genesis chapter number 49. Genesis chapter 49. I want to preach on this subject, achieving stability in your Christian life. Achieving stability in your Christian life. We'll begin in verse number 1 of Genesis chapter 49. And uh, we'll read down through verse 4. Genesis 49 beginning at verse 1. Let's all stand for the reading of the Bible. Genesis chapter 49 and verse number 1. Bible says, And Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. Gather yourselves together and hear, ye sons of Jacob, <clears throat> and hearken unto Israel your father. Notice what he says about Reuben, verse 3 and 4. Reuben, thou art my firstborn, my might and the beginning of my strength, and the excellency of dignity, and the excellency of power. Unstable as water, thou shalt not excel, because thou wentest up to thy father's bed, then defilest thou it, he went up to my couch. Notice what he said about Reuben. <clears throat> Verse number three, he calls him his firstborn. He calls him my might, the beginning of my strength the excellency of dignity, the, the excellency of power. What amazing character traits. And it's almost shocking to read what's next. Unstable as water, thou shalt not excel. In other words, what he's saying was this. You have remarkable character traits, remarkable personality, Remarkable talents, but you will not excel because of one issue in your life that you will not fix. Reuben, you're a good boy, but you're unstable. Let's uh, let the Lord speak to us this morning. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we broach this important subject, I would ask, Lord, that you'd let me have the ears of the young men in our church, the young ladies in our church. Lord, I appreciate these uh, that are filling the first several rows on both sides, to my right, to my left. Lord, I, I see in so many of them great character traits, you know, great personalities, good kids. Lord, I pray that they would get a hold of the one thing that, that if they do not get a hold of, will just come back to undermine again and again everything they try to do in life. And Lord, I pray, dear God, for those of us that are a little older, for our young adults, that if you'll that you'll help us if there's inconsistencies in our life in these areas, that you'll help us. Thank you for stability. Thank you for the testimonies of Christian stability that is scattered all over this room. Lord, I pray, dear God, that we'd learn from the word of God. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And you may be seated. Four places in the Bible you'll find the word unstable. We're going to visit each of those in just a bit. Brother Don Mowry has been out fishing and do, done so successfully. And when he does that, him and Sister Jean will begin to stop at the back door and say, when are you and Cheryl going to come over for a fish fry? So they have to twist my arm pretty hard. But last Thursday night, I went over to Brother Don and Sister Jean's house, me and my wife, and he'd 
fried up some fish and she had made a, all the fixings to go with it. And, and I just ate myself into a pitiful stupor. But man, we had a good time. It was good, good stuff. I'm driving home and I'm thanking God for Brother Don. Thanking God for Sister Jean. Folks, listen to me. Brother Don got saved a little later on life, in life. But from the time he got saved, you know what? He had some things in his life that accelerated his Christian life. There was stability. There was stability. Through the years, all the years my dad pastored, he didn't have to worry about whether or not Don Mary would be here on a Wednesday night or wonder if he'll show up this Sunday or wonder if he'll show up men's visitation or wonder if he'll show up on a work day. There was stability there. And folks, that's the testimony that if you young people will look around, it's all over this room. Some of them were raised up in it. I look back here at Bill English and me and him were raised up in it. We were both in attendance at the very first service at Blessed Old Baptist Church. The first service they had in 1973 in Bob Swaby's living room. We uh, wanted to be there. We woke up our parents, made them take us there. And uh, because even early on, we were stable. We were, yeah, stable. That was us. He didn't have to be here today. But he sits here today. You think about that. I'm talking about when you're measuring faithfulness in decades. I don't mean a little faithfulness. I don't mean fringe. I don't mean in. I don't mean out. I mean Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, preacher in every way, in every way I can, help me to plug in. I was talking to Brother Don about his daughter, Darcy. And Sister Darcy, thank you for your faithfulness. If any of you young ladies want an example of what it means to have Christian stability, you might want to just put Darcy Mowry's life under the microscope and learn some things. You might listen, a wise young lady that wants to be in this long term and not make stupid decisions and not mess up in life might want to scrape together some dollars and take that lady back there and don't let her buy you lunch. You buy her lunch and just pick her brain. Just talk to her and just say, how do you stay in this full time? How do you do this? Anytime I start naming people, I can leave out people, but I, I really mean this. I was sitting up here just, you know, Brother Tom, as a, as a young person, was in church. Folks, listen to me. He's old now. I mean, he's terribly old now. It's, it's my age old. I mean, that's bad when you're my age old. And you know what? You know where he's at? He's there. You know what he's doing? He's doing what he's always done. Listen, none of the people I'm mentioning are perfect. But the reason they're in it, you know, I'm so pleased that I, I mean this, that I get to go to the same church with my brother, my sister. And I mean that. I don't say a lot about them because, I, you know, I think they really want to be mentioned a lot. And, but, but you know what? They don't have a history of in church, out of church, in the right church, in the wrong church, not in church. You know, there was, listen. With all of our imperfections, and I'll stand at the front of the line when it comes to imperfections, there's some things that, there's something that's in a person that's in this faithfully long-term, long, and it's called stability. Stability. And if you are unstable, now listen, because that's a Bible word. I don't care what the, what the world says about that word. There is a way to be stable spiritually, and there are some people that are spiritually unstable. If I wanted to, if I was mean enough, I could get up here and stand and call the names of men that when I was a boy was in this church. And you know what? They were Sunday school teachers, and they were bus drivers, and they were bus workers. And, and you know what? While I was here for a while, they were here. But the rest of their life has not carried a testimony of faithfulness some point they were out of church and then they'd come back in church and then they'd be out of church and and then they'd go to the wrong kind of church and then they, you know, they're up, they're down, they're left, they're right. I mean, their life is anything but an example of spiritual stability. Now, young people, listen to me. You don't have to ride that roller coaster your whole life. You don't have to be up and down and in and out and 
right and wrong and righter and then wronger. You know what you can do? You can le learn the secret to spiritual stability. That's what we're going to spend some time looking at. I appreciate those in our church that have been faithful. I appreciate them. Achieving stability in your Christian life. What is the Bible def definition of the word unstable? Well, Genesis 49, verse number 4, Unstable as water, thou shalt not excel. If you look up that word, it means to have within you sudden outbursts. It talks about the idea of boiling or bubbling up. It's kind of like a pan of water that's either in the process of, of, of beginning to boil or begin to bubble or to begin to boil over. It comes with these words, an eruption, an explosion, a flare-up. In other words, that at sometimes they're calm, and then there's an outburst. Sometimes they're the right temperature, then they're too hot, they're boiling over. Then sometimes they're peaceful, and then there's an eruption. Sometimes there's calm, and there's an explosion, and up and down, and in and out. They're unstable. They're unstable. In James 1.8, we read this verse, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. You look up that word, it means inconstant, inconstant. So there's constant and there's inconstant, or the opposite of constant. Some people are constant. They're just there. You can just count on them. They're just there. Just like that. Some people are... And that's their whole life. Now think about that. We read in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 14, having eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin. By the way, that's talking about false prophets. Who can they beguile? Beguiling unstable souls. Unstable souls. In 2 Peter 3, 16, we read, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, or they wrestle with, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. So here we have a Bible definition of unstable. It's, it's, it's these, this, uh, instead of being consistent and calm, there's these great highs and great lows, outbursts and boilings over and, and eruptions and explosions and flare-ups. There's in constant, unfixed, vacillating, constantly vacillating. Yet the Bible says in Proverbs 16, 32, He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that wrote his spirit than he that taketh a city. And young man, I don't care how many weights you can lift or how fast you can run. You know what? If you want to be more mighty than a man that can take a city, you have to know how to rule your own spirit. You know no. You need to know how to stabilize your Christian life. Stabilize your Christian life. I was thinking of my father this week as I was preparing this message, and most of you know that my father's life first was 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Here's the goal. Therefore, my blood brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You know what, folks, again, we're not talking about being perfect. My dad wasn't perfect, but you realize from the time he got saved in 1966 till he passed away in, in uh, uh, 2011, 2011, I had to find the right date there, you realize there's not periods of time where he was inconsistent in the important things. I mean, from the time he got saved, and my mom said, if we're going to be Christians, we're going to be Christians. And if we're going to go to church, we're going to go to church. And if the hinges squeak, we're walking in the door. We're talking about stability. We're talking about um, achieving stability in your Christian life. You say, preacher, why is that important? Why is it such a big deal? I mean, if I feel like going, why can't I just go when I feel like going? When I don't feel like going, just not do what I... Why, why do what I don't feel like doing? What's wrong with being... You know, up one day and down the next. And matter of fact, the world will even glorify that. But the Bible talks about the dangers of instability. Let me tell you on it real quick. We're going to reference our four verses again. 
instability will undermine your success. Unstable as water, thou shalt not excel. Folks, the problem is, is that a long-term, day-in, day-out consistency of life is what produces the greatest successes in life. And so if you don't get a hold of this, if you continue to be unstable, it's going to undermine your successes in life. Thou shalt not excel. Number two, instability will affect all areas of your life. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Look right up here. If you can't be faithful to church, how are you going to be faithful to a man or a woman one of these days when you say, I do? Come on. You can't be faithful to God who's perfect? How are you going to be faithful to a human being who's not perfect? We're talking about stability here. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Instability will affect all areas of your life. If you don't get a hold of this, it's not like I'm just going to be unstable in this one, unstable in this one arena. No, it's like 11 at 11 the whole long. Number three, instability will destroy your discernment. Who is the false prophet able to uh, deceive, beguiling, unstable souls? You know what? You're, you're easy pickings for the devil. You're easy to be beguiled. You're easy to be tricked. Uh, mentally unstable. Come on, listen. Mentally unstable. Emotionally unstable. Spiritually unstable. Those are the kind of people that folks can take advantage of. Number four, instability will hinder you from understanding and obeying the scriptures. Second Peter 3.16, it says, In which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest or wrestle with as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. It's amazing to me how many people who are unstable in all every other area of their life are unstable in their belief system. I mean, they'll tell you that they believe this. Come on, they'll walk down the aisle and they make a decision somewhere. And boy, they get up and they seem like they've got it and they've nailed it down. And then two months later, they're on the other end of that. Up and down, in and out, hot and cold. I'm going to serve God. I'm not going to serve God. I'm going to go to church. I'm not going to go to church. You know, and it's like they, they, they have trouble understanding and obeying the scriptures because of this matter of instability. And there's so many faces flashing through my mind. Folks, you can't serve in the same ministry as for as long as I have. And those of you that have been here faithfully, you've watched it. How many times have we seen through our visitation or our bus ministry or our soul winning efforts, a, a couple get saved or an adult gets saved and they come in and we and we uh, see them come to Christ and we watch them come forward and we fill the card out and we watch them be baptized and all of a sudden they start coming and, and they begin hitting faithfully and coming faithfully and all of a sudden their, their, their appearance begins to change as they learn from the Bible the way a Christian is supposed to act and look. And, and boy, it looks like maybe for a year, 18 months, two years, you just think, man, they're going to be. And then where'd they go? Where'd they go? And two or three years later, I get the Lenten paper and I look and there's their picture and they got busted for cooking meth. I go, what in the world? Now, young people, just because you're here today, just because you're here today does not mean that you're not going to be in trouble. Well, I went to church when I was 14. Well, you could be in jail when you're 24. I mean, one of the funniest things, I guess funny, maybe it's not. First time me and Ron Allen went over to Sullivan County Jail. I'd never been in the jail ministry. I was going to go teach Ron how to do something I'd never done. So if you don't know what you're doing, at least act confident. Amen. So, so I check in. They check us all in. We empty our pockets. We go through all the routine. We, they unlock the, the prison door, jail door. We walk in. And the guard's behind us, and I think, well, he's coming in with us. He pushed the two of us in, slammed the door and locked it, and walked away. And are sitting around a table in the middle of this area. Many of you know what I'm talking about. You've been to jail. And, uh, but uh, there's a table, you know, that they're all sitting at. And then there's little side rooms like this. And they all get up as soon as we walk in and they all go to their rooms. 
I thought, well, this is going to be a good meeting. You know what they do? All but one of them come back, only they're carrying a Bible with them. They'd heard we were coming. And they sat there and, you know, I don't know how to break the ice. I've never been in this situation before. And I said, my name is Pastor Jerry Ross from Blessed Hope Baptist Church in Jasonville, Indiana. I don't know if, if any of you have ever heard of Blessed Hope Baptist Church just outside of Jasonville. We run the red and white buses. And I don't know why I said this, but I said, how many of you ever ridden one of our red and white buses? And half of them rose, raised their hands. I thought, that's awesome, you know. Is that awesome? <laughs> hey, I'm looking right over here, young man, and I want you to really listen to me. Focus in on what I'm saying. Well, listen, you don't get some things straightened out in your life. You can come to church. You can get you a Bible. You can spend the rest of your life talking about, yeah, when I was a kid, when I was a kid, when I was a kid, and your life can be a train wreck in 10 or 15 years. Be a train wreck. These precious young ladies and little girls that come up, and I mean, they just make our entire day, and they come up with their big smiles on their faces and come through the door, and everybody's glad to see them. You have, listen, young ladies, you can't even imagine 10, 15 years from, not, uh, from now what a wreck your life could be if you don't learn to stabilize your Christian life. Finding stability in your Christian life. All right, let's get into it. How do you... Have a stable Christian life. What about these that have done it? What's the secret? Now, let me give you a good Bible principle. Number one, stop letting changing circumstances change you. Stop letting changing circumstances change you. What is the Bible cure for mental, emotional, and spiritually spiritual instability? Stop letting changing circumstances change you. Where do you get that, preacher? Genesis 49.4 said this, unstable as water. Now, why did they choose water? Unstable. Why did, why did Jacob say to Reuben, unstable as water? Now, think about water, young people. Are you thinking? You know what? Water changes depending on its circumstance, its environment. Okay. You have water and it's room temperature like it is in here, and it's a liquid. If we take it over and we put it in the freezer, we won't, we'll go back in just a, a short time, and you know what? It'll be ice. And then you can take that ice and break it loose in a container and put it in a pan and put it on the stove, and it'll go back to liquid. But before long, if you leave it, it'll go to steam. It just all depends on the environment around it. It just changes according to its circumstance. If it's cold, it turns to ice. If it's room temperature, it stays, stays uh, uh, liquid. If it hits the boiling point, it goes to steam. And I just described a lot of human beings that are walking around on this planet right now. Come on, young ladies. Come on, young men. You come to church, you act like a Christian. School's getting ready to start. You go to your public school, you sit at the wrong table at lunchtime, and all the guys are cursing and carrying on and acting like heathens. The next thing you know, you're cursing, carrying on and acting like a heathen. You're unstable as water. You're unstable as water. Let me say what, what the Bible says. You will not excel. You will not excel. At some point, part of being a young man is saying, you know what, I'm a Christian. I believe in Jesus Christ. I've accepted him as my personal shape. Hey, he shed his blood so that you could go to heaven. All right? He, he suffered horribly on that cross to pay for my sins and yours. If he was willing to do that, you know what? I'm not just going to be a Christian when it's convenient. I'm not just going to be a Christian when, when I'm around Christians. What I'm going to do is decide I'm going to be a Christian. I'm going to be a Christian on my good days. I'm going to be a Christian on my bad days. I'm going to be a Christian when I'm at work. I'm going to be a Christian when I'm at church. I'm going to be a Christian when I'm at school. I'm going to be a Christian when I'm, I'm, I'm out there playing volleyball after church. Let's just settle it. Stop letting circumstances change you. As a Christian, we don't let circumstances change us. We change the circumstances around us. There's a little box, a little white box right over there. Some of you guys know what it is and some of you don't. Let, 
get these two guys setting up, okay? Wake those guys up. Hey, set up and look, okay? I'm trying to teach you something, all right? What we're doing here is important. If you want to be unstable as water, sleep during church, all right? There's a little box over there on the wall. It's got two numbers on it. There's a little box underneath that brown box back there. It's got two little numbers on it, okay? You can look at it, but don't touch it. All right. It's got two numbers on it. One of the numbers, because you see it's doing two things. That box right there is a thermometer. And you know what it's doing? It's reading the temperature of the room. And it will tell you the temperature of the room. Okay, it'll tell you the temperature. There's another number. and There's a little arrow up or down. That's the thermostat. Okay, and if you want it to be warmer, you push the up button. If you want it to be cooler, you push the down button. One of those numbers, if you change the number, it'll change the temperature of the room. The other number just reflects and tells you what the tip. Listen, are you going to be a thermometer or are you going to be a thermostat? Come on, this day and age, we need Christians to get vocal again. I talked a little bit about it in our... Sunday school class. I can't believe how many Christians just surrendered your freedom of speech. Stand up and speak up for the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't let the spirit of fear keep you from saying the things that you ought to say. Young men, if you're around people that are doing wrong, say, excuse me, but if you're going to continue to do this and act this way, I've got better things to do and walk away. Okay, listen, your Sunday school teacher can't follow you to school. Come on, even, as, even our Christian school kids here, your mom and dad, it's not always going to be with you. They're not always there holding your hand. What you've got to do, learn in your life, is to not let circumstances change you. So stop setting, letting us uh, changing circumstance change you. Number two, decide to let the Bible stabilize your belief system. Decide to let the Bible stabilize your belief system. So in Genesis 49, verse 4, stable as water, unstable as water, thou shalt not excel. That's talking about circumstances, changing water and changing the form it takes. But wait a minute, James 1, 8, a double-minded man, a double-minded man, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. What does that mean? An unstable life is the result Many times of a double-mindedness. What is double-mindedness, preacher? If you look up that little phrase there, it means two-spirited or vacillating in opinion or purpose. In opinion or purpose. Well, I have an opinion about this this week, and I think this about it. And then, you know, next week I've talked to several people, and I've changed my opinion. And then I talked to some other people, and I've changed my opinion about it again. You know why you're talking to people. You're, you're reading what they post on Facebook. You're letting them talk you in things and out of things. Come on, I'm trying to help you. What's the difference between those that are stable and those that are faithful and those that still believe what they believed 40 years ago? You know what it is? They've decided to let the Bible stabilize their belief system. Listen, folks, I'm not double-minded. I'm not double-minded. I'm singularly minded. You say, well, what do you think about abortion? I think what the Bible thinks about abortion. It's easy. I think what the Bible thinks. I agree with the Bible. I agree with God. What's your opinion on homosexuality? I, I believe what the Bible believes about it. The Bible says it's an abomination. That's why I say it's an abomination. Bible says it's a wicked, lewd sin. That's why I say it's a wicked, lewd sin. But preacher, you don't understand. The culture has changed. And, and the, the people in control have... It doesn't matter. I'm not double-minded about it. Preacher, what do you believe about modesty? I believe what the Bible says about modesty. If you said, ask me what my opinion was about something I don't have an opinion yet, I'd say, I don't know what it is yet. Let me study the Bible and I'll get back with you and tell you what my opinion is. You know how... Listen, you know how you, you, you prevent yourself from spending your life being double-minded? Is that you spend a lifetime reading this book and studying this book and deciding that whatever this book says, wherever it draws the line, wherever it, whatever it says is right is going to be right, whatever it says is wrong is going to be wrong, 
And you know what? The men and the women that have long term sat in this church and been the pillars of this church and been here, I'm talking about for decades and have held positions. They are not double minded. They've got a King James Holy Bible. They read it at their house. They bring it to church. They open it in their laps. They look at it when the preacher's preaching and they decided I'm going to let the Bible decide how I think about things. Now that may sound simple, but folks, good night. You realize how many people claim to receive Christ and they literally, if it comes down to their opinion and what the Bible says, they're double-minded. They would rather they would rather believe what they believe no matter what the Bible says. Now listen, there's some things you just ought to settle. Let me just give you some things you ought to settle when it comes to this book. Settle this. The Bible contains the very words of God. This is not a book that was written by men, folks. 2 Peter 1, 20, verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 20 and 21, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. How about this? And from a child, 2 Timothy chapter 3, from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for corrections, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Listen, I believe this. I believe that this King James Holy Bible contains the very words of God. When I read these words, I'm reading God's words. Yes, he used holy men of old, but they moved, were moved or controlled by the Holy Spirit. Every single verse was given by inspiration of God. That means by the very breath of God. When I read this book, it's not just another book. It's the very words of God. And because of that, I'm going to believe God over man. And I'm going to believe God even over me. Even over me. Settle this. The Bible contains the very words of God. Settle this. One Bible contains the very words of God for English-speaking people. That Bible is the King James Bible. Listen, there's a pamphlet you can get back in the track rack on your way out. I think it's up there at the top on the right-hand side. And it... And it and it destroys the NIV perversions. The NIV perversion. And folks, listen to me. There's a lot of other... Oh, well, I, I carry a Bible, but I don't have a King James Bible. We'll get you a King James Bible. Okay, if there's only one place... And let me, let me read the Bible to you here, so you know what I'm saying is biblical. Psalms 12, verse 6 and 7. The words, the words, the very words, the words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. So David wrote this back in the days of his life. And he said, you know what? When I received these words, they were pure, pure words. They, they, as silver tried in a furnace of fire, purified seven times. Then he said, Lord, thou shalt keep them. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation and forever. And folks, listen to me. David had the very words of God, and I had the very words of God. He, the Bible promised that God would preserve them for every generation. So somewhere, for the English-speaking people, the very words of God have been preserved. One of the things you'll read if you grab that NIV perversion pamphlet is how many verses that are in the King James Bible, are not even in the NIV. I think it's 18 di different verses that if you turn there and try to find it in the NIV Bible, they are just missing. The whole verse is gone. Now, it's not like they can renumber it. Try to fool us. You know, the numbers have been attached to the verses a long time, so you'll just be reading down in chapter 3, and it'll be 14, 15, 17. Gone. Gone. There was a young man who we reached in Shelburne, Indiana. Been many years ago, I think I was youth pastor here then. I may have just started pastoring. One of those young men that, man, he got saved and he got on fire and he got excited. And got his hair cut and next thing you know, he's wearing a shirt and tie. And I mean, man, alive. He was just going, wanted to go soul winning with our young people and all of that. 
You know what? All of a sudden, he was going to Shelburne. He was Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. And then all of a sudden, he started missing a few services here and there. Finally, I tracked him down, went over there and visited him. Where are you doing? What are you doing? Well, I've been going Wednesday nights at this other church. I love these other churches that won't go knock on doors. Come on, they won't knock on doors. They won't soul win. Come on, they come on. They won't run buses. But as soon as some kid starts going to Blessed Oak Baptist Church, then all of a sudden one of the local preachers wake up, notices it, and goes down there and tries to get him to go to their church. He said, well, they've got a youth thing down there. I said, we've got youth things here. Yeah, but the youth pastor at that church, he uh, has me come over to his house and we hang out and stay up half the night playing video games. I said, well, that's not going to happen at Blessed Oak Baptist Church. But I said, we do have assistant pastors and pastors that will take you soul winning. By the way, they'll, they'll teach you to go to work. Come on. They'll take you to football camp, let you get your brains beat out. Come on, Brother Gordon will take you out in the woods for three or four or five weeks at a time and not let you eat and, and you know, starve you half to death and teach you survival skills. And But we're not going to sit around and play video games with you. Listen, we're not worldly. We're not trying to make you worldly. So all of a sudden, you know what, that guy, that listen, that apostate, that false prophet swooped in and got that kid going to a, a church that teaches false doctrine. And all, all of a sudden, it's been a year and I haven't seen him. I'm preaching in the pulpit here one Sunday and I look in the back and he comes walking to the back door and he sits back there and he's got this smug look on his face. And I'm preaching away and after I get done, he waits Respect, respectfully off the side and as soon as most of the people's gone he goes hey Pastor Jerry can I talk to you I said sure so why don't we go back to my office went back to my office he walked in couldn't wait to show me his NIV Bible he said I just wanted to tell you, you know, I've been pretty faithful to this other church and uh, you know I got to they gave me this Bible and I wanted to show it to you well thank you because I didn't even know they had that Bible out there I'm sure glad you showed that to me and he said these are so much this one's so much easier to understand well, I had that pamphlet in my office drawer, so I opened it up and opened it up, and I said, get your NIV Bible. I want you to turn some, some verses. By the way, Brother Eric, would you get me that one of those pamphlets bring it up there? And so I had the pamphlet right up there. I don't have it memorized, but I had the pamphlet right up there, and I opened it up. And I said, you got your NIV Bible? And he said, yeah. I said, you ever done a Bible drill? He said, no. Is that a video game? And I'm like, no, it's not a video game. And get your Bible ready, and you can look these up. I mean, come on, you been over there at that other church for a whole year. You ought to know your Bible, you know. So I said, turn to Matthew chapter 17, verse 21. By the way, if you have an NIV this morning, go ahead and let's play the game. Okay, turn to Matthew 17, 21. You know what you'll find out? It's not there. Matthew 17, 20 is there. Matthew 17, 22 is there. Matthew 17, 21. I mean, it's gone. I said, turn to Matthew 18, 11. And he starts searching, and he read 10, 12. And then he just looked up at me. I said, turn to Matthew 23, 14. Guess what? It's not there. Turn to Mark 7, 16. Not there. Turn to Mark 9, 44. Gone. Mark 9, 46. Gone. Mark 11, 26. Gone. Mark 15, 28. Gone. What, what am I, why are you going through this, preacher? Because you're never going to get stable till you settle on the fact that this is God's word and you're going to live or die by the words in this book and you're going to treat these words as if they're God's words, God's commands, and you put them in a place of respect and honor in your life above anything and everything. And if God says it, you're going to believe it, you're going to obey it, you're going to do it, and you'll have a stable Christian life. By the way, some of you ought to get to an altar this morning and ask God to forgive you for the disrespect that you've showed with your life concerning this book right here. I said, keep looking, son. We having a good time yet? I look for Luke 17, 26. Not there. Luke 23, 17. Not there. John 5, 4. Not there. Acts 8, 37. Well, I go to a church. They use the NIV. Well, confess your sins to someone else. I'm not a priest. That's why we have an altar. Well, this church is better, and this church is, no, it's, it's not either. Acts 8.37, Acts 15.34, gone. Acts 24.7, gone. Acts 28.28, 28, gone. 
Romans 16, 24, gone. 1 John 5, 7, gone. God. Now think about this. Twelve whole verses after Mark 16, 8, the NIV. Now these verses are there, but it says with a little footnote there, the most reliable early manuscripts and other ancient witnesses do not have Mark 16, 9 through 20. Uh, does Do not have Mark 16, 9 through 20. So there's another 12 verses, even though there it's gone. You realize the NIV has taken away 64,576 words that are in the King James Bible that are gone. I didn't say 6,000. I said 64,500. You know why Don Mary's got a stable life? Come on. You know why when we celebrate Jack and Finney's 50th anniversary, you can look back through the pictures of a lifetime in church and a lifetime serving God and a life. You know why? Because they figured out that they had God's word. And they decided, come on, as a young person, as a young couple, they decided, we're just going to live by this book. Okay? Well, preacher, I feel this way today, and this way the next day we'll go to the Bible. It don't change. It's not a mood ring. Come on. They sell mood rings still? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Have they made a comeback? Have they made a comeback? They have the mood stuff out there now? Yeah, okay. All right, good. Good. Some of you need it because you're always in a mood. So, you know, you, you feel hateful, so the mood Bible all of a sudden erases all the verses on love because you feel hateful. No, it doesn't. It has those verses there in black and white. It don't change. All of a sudden, I'm uncompassionate and caring. I don't want to go soul winning. All of a sudden, all the commands to go soul winning don't just mood out of the Bible because, listen, I'm talking about how to live a stable life. First of all, you've got to stop letting the circumstance around you change you. Secondly, you've got to get a hold of this book. Good night. Just, just listen, I want to read something to you. When it comes to the Bible, we're just not treating, i got a generation coming up that's treating this Bible with such disrespect, it makes me sick. Psalms 119.57. You know what David said about the Bible? Thou art my portion, O Lord. I have said that I would keep thy words. I have said that I would keep thy words. He made a commitment. How about Psalms 119.103? How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. How about Psalms 119.130? The entrance of thy words giveth light. Words, words, words. Words, the very words of God giveth light. It giveth understanding to the simple. I, I can't make it any plainer than Deuteronomy. Listen, Deuteronomy 11, 26, 28. Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. Listen. Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. A blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day. And a curse if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside out of the way which I command you this day to go after other little G gods which ye have not known. And you know what, folks? Let me tell you this. I want you all to look up here. And you know what? You're going to have to answer to God and you can do whatever. You're going to do what you're going to do and that's whatever. But right now, this preacher is setting before you a blessing and a curse. This book can be the greatest blessing of your life. It can, be the great, it can bring the greatest curse upon your life. And it all depends on what you're going to do with it and how you're going to treat it. You know how you get stable? Okay? You stop changing your opinion to match the opinions of all the idiots you're hanging around or all your little stupid Facebook friends. And you turn all that junk off and you get into King James Holy Bible and you start at Genesis 1 one and you read it all the way through and everything that God says, you say amen to. And if your life isn't lining up, you change it. Because listen, the circumstances have changed. The culture is going to change. What the world says is right and wrong is going to change. But this book does not change. Why'd you go off on the NIV? Because I'm tired of men trying to change the book to fit them instead of letting the book change them. We need to stop correcting the Bible, and start letting the Bible correct us. Now, now think about, I'm talking about stability here. Man, a lot. Number three, proper ordering of your soul will produce inward stability. I'm not going to take time to teach for all this. Maybe I should. <laughs> proper ordering of your soul. Beguiling unstable souls. 
That's what the Bible says. Well, what's an unstable soul? An unstable soul is a soul that's not properly ordered. Brother Nathan, on my information desk back there, is that in a folder, vanilla folder? Bring me that stuff. I want to show you something real quick. It's worth it. And I had to get one, somebody get a pamphlet. I like this. We're just going to leave pieces of my sermon everywhere, and we've got men that can run them to me when I need them. Beguiling unstable souls. Well, if you come here Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and I mention the word soul, then you know what I'm talking about. What's an unstable soul? Is your, listen, let me ask you a question. Is your soul unstable? If, it, if it's unstable, then you're going to be beguiled very easily. Come on. Devil's making a chump out of you. <laughs> Think about this. All right, let me get organized here. I like that one. All right, let me have four of our guys here. Jonathan, can I use you? Michael, I'll use you. Brother Max, Brother Ian, come on up here. This is worth the few minutes it'll take, amen. I, I want you to get stable. You know, well, that church has just changed. Jerry Ross is preaching the same thing that I preached when I was 20 years old. Right. Preaching the same book, standing for the same thing. You know, think about it. This is you before you got saved. So, let me move you down that side. <laughs> you stand over here. Holy Spirit, wow. There you go. That's you before you got saved. You're a body, you're a soul, but your spirit is dead in trespasses and sins. I won't go back through and I'll teach that. There was a day when somebody shared the gospel of Jesus Christ with you. And you know what? If you're saved here today, then God's spirit, Holy Spirit, convicted you of your sin. By the way, if you just prayed some little prayer and there was no conviction, you there was no conversion. Okay, I'm sorry. There's, so the Holy Spirit... So, Somebody preachers preaching the truth and preaching that you're a sinner and preaching that you're going to go to hell if you don't get saved and tell you how much God loved you and that Jesus died on the cross for you, was buried and rose again, and he's got the gift of eternal life, and all you got to do is turn from your sins to Christ and accept him as your Savior, and man, you get under conviction, you cry out, and ask Jesus to save you, and the Holy Spirit comes inside of you, inside of you. And he comes down here and he performs a miracle. Jesus said, except a man be born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. That's you now. If you're saved, that's you. Okay, there is a fundamental, amazing, transforming difference between a lost person and a saved person. Because not only now are they back to being a triune being, but they have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit inside of them. Now you got a chance where you can commune with God, live for God, and your life can be amazing. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. That is a new creature. That is an amazing, miraculous, divine difference in you. And all you kids that come on the bus when you got saved, that's what happened inside of you, whether you understand it or not. But you know what? When you first get saved, you're not ordered properly. Let me have you step up here. Let me have you step behind, come in behind. And then Brother Max, let me have you one more step up. We're talking about ordering your soul, ordering your yourself. When you get saved, the flesh has run the show for so long that you know what? You may be saved, but you're a baby. You're a babe in Christ. Okay, and, and this thing's been, it's just because you got saved don't mean the flesh just surrenders. And so this is the order of the new Christian. But you know what? As you go to church and as you, the Word of God is preached and the Holy Spirit begins to work and communicate to that reborn spirit, and people begin to talk to you about the importance of letting God control your life. And Hey, you're indwelt by the Spirit. He's not there just to, to reside in you. He wants to preside over you, and you surrender to God's will and, and God's leading and the control of the Holy Spirit in your life, and all of a sudden you start making decisions at camps and conferences, and you say, my flesh isn't going to run the show anymore. I'm going to put him at the back of the line. I'm going to switch you two around. And all of a sudden, now, 
Let me move you just a little this way so they can see the pictures. There you go. That gets you properly ordered. Okay. But the Bible says they don't beguile, it says they beguile your soul. Now your soul is also a trinity. Hold this one up above. Mind, heart, and will. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about why you're unstable. I'm talking about why some people are unstable. Beguiles unstable souls. So all of a sudden now we're going to take a look at the soul. Let me borrow you soul. I'm just going to rip the soul out of this person. Bring him over here. Now, let me take this away. Now all of a sudden... This is a triune being. Hold that up above your head as high as you can. Let me bring you three over here. And let me re-sort you. All right? You three stand like this in a line. Now, the soul right here in front of him in a line like this. Christian school kids, I'm telling you. There you go. The soul is a trinity, too. I'm talking about, listen. This is worth a few minutes, folks. Oh, I don't know why. I'm just up to one day and down the next. I want to go to church one time. I don't want to go to church. And the Bible is important and it's not important. And then I feel bad about sin. I don't feel bad about sin. And ah, ah, ah. What are you, two? I mean, that's nursery stuff. And that's, that's the average carnal Christian. Okay. You know why you're easily beguiled? Because your soul is unstable. Now, let me play around with this a little bit. Soul, sit down over there. Now, you realize that this is now we're talking about the soul, and these are the three parts of the soul, okay? All right. Let me tell you, show you all the different ways you can shuffle this guy around. Wrong order. Easily beguiled. Hey, what are the parts here, preacher? This is your mind. This is your heart. This is your thinker. This is your feeler, your emotions. This is your decider. Okay, the will is the decider, what I'm going to do. Some of you decide before you think. Hey, you want to go do this? Yeah. Yeah. That sounds cool. It sounds cool. What did they just ask you to do? I don't know. Something fun, I think. And you just go from train wreck, train wreck, stupid decision. You get in with this one there. You know, you you decide before you think. You decide before you even feel. You just decide. Now, here's a lot of people. Okay, you feel something and you make a decision based on your feelings. You'll read a sad story on Facebook. <laughs> That's just terrible. That's just terrible the way they're treating these transgender people. It's just terrible. So everybody against them are just hateful because look at this transgender person. They committed suicide and so Christians are hateful. Because somebody wrote a sappy story. That, that uh, come on, come on, that appealed to the emotions. So all of a sudden, I've just changed the way I think about it. You're not even thinking, you're feeling. Okay? Let me bring you up here. If you want to keep from being beguiled, you have to have your soul ordered in the right way. Now listen to me. Watch this. How many times, Brother Nathan, have I said this? Listen. Think scripturally. How do you have a stable Christian life? Hey, you want to come do this with us? What are you doing? By the way, it might, ask, it might not hurt to ask questions, get information before you make a decision. Well, we're going to go here, and we're going to go do this, and we're going to go do that. Think scripturally. What does the Bible say about that activity? What does the Bible say about the people that I'd be spending time with? What does the Bible say about separation? What does the Bible say about modesty? What does the Bible say about 
Not only doing evil, but avoiding the appearance of evil. Think scripturally. Feel appropriately. You know why your, your emotions are all over the place? It's because they're not controlled through scriptural thinking. What was our point? Our point is this. Let the word of God be the basis. Let me say it right. Decide to let the Bible stabilize your belief system. You get in, you study the Bible. Listen, you're not going to bring an emotional story and talk me out of a Bible principle. You're not going to tank, bring some sad statistics and talk me out of a Bible principle. Uh, liberals love to feel. They don't like to think they want you to feel a certain way. And so you're, I'm supposed to base decisions on their feelings overflowing and creating the same feelings in me, but the problem is there's something that stands between me and them, and that's the Bible and a brain. So you study the Bible, you read the Bible, and you see things through God's eyes, the way God views them scripturally, biblically. And how I think about something is how I'm going to feel about it. By the way, can I say this? If God hates something, I'm going to hate it. God loves something, I'm going to love it. God's for something, I'm going to be for it. Well, I just think hate's terrible. You better study your Bible. There's a lot of things God hates. Yeah, God gives a list in the book of Proverbs of seven things he hates. Well, you Christians are haters. We, we should be, if we're obeying the Bible, should hate the things God hates. By the way, God doesn't hate people. He hates sin. But, you know, if someone's sinning and we hate that sin, then they want to say we hate that person. We don't hate the person. God proved that he loved people. He sent his son to die on the cross for them. Think scripturally, feel appropriately, and then decide wisely. Think scripturally. I'm talking about stability. You know, come to my office, you're all emotional about something, and you just want me to be emotional with you, and I'm not going to be emotional with you because I'll make a bad decision if I'm emotional. Preacher, I just feel like sometimes you don't have compassion. No, I just won't lead with my heart. Why don't you try it? Okay. It was a little sissy. She went home and she laid on her bed and she cried and cried and cried and cried because you said this from the pulpit. Is what I said from the pulpit true? Yes. Then why wasn't she at an altar crying and repenting over the sin in her life? But you want to leave the church because your daughter's upset because I preach the truth. Or your son's upset because I preach Or your wife, hello, how many times, is mad because I just preach the truth. But what I'm supposed to do is I'm supposed to be emotional like you're being emotional. Sir, if you want to lead with your heart and become a teenage girl and make decisions, emotions first, brain second, then do it. But the only way we're going to have stability in our churches and stability in our families is if we get to the point where we say this book will decide what I believe, how I view life, what is right, what is wrong. And you know what? You can bring me any sad story you want to. It's not changing this book. And I am going to think scripturally. I'm going to feel appropriately. And then I'm going to act or decide wisely. I'm going to think scripturally. Say it with me. Think scripturally. I'm going to what? Think scripturally. I'm going to feel appropriately. I'm going to feel appropriately. I'm going to feel appropriately. And then I'm going to act or decide wisely. Let's do decide. I'm going to decide wisely. I'm going to decide why. Y'all are, are into this. And I know it's because if we just say it, maybe he'll let us go. And I will. Let's all stand. Thank you, gentlemen. <laughs> You've been patient. I've gone a little longer than normal. I want, I want to help you. I'm not your enemy. I want to help you. I'm not your enemy. I'm not your enemy. I want to help you. I want to help you. Well, I love God. Three weeks later. Four weeks later. What? what? 
Heavenly Father, help us. Help us. The world needs to see Christians who have their act together. They need to see Christians that are different. They need to see Christians that aren't changing. I mean, how in the world can a, a man be an independent fundamental Baptist pastor and 10 years later not go to church and be tattooed and have earrings? How in the world can a Sunday school teacher go from teaching young ladies in an independent fundamental Baptist church to hanging out in the bars 10 years later? How can a man go from being a bus captain, picking up little children, and bringing them to church and leading them to the Lord, to posting foul, wicked, sexual things on Facebook? Lord, no wonder the world's mocking the Bible. Help us, Lord to stabilize our Christian life. Help us to stop letting circumstances change us. May we recommit to the Bible. Politically correct or not, it doesn't matter. Whatever the world thinks, let them think. We're going to stand on the ball. Lord, may we get our soul and our lives ordered in such a way where the